I think there's a lot of challenges that are sort of looming. And at the moment, they're not crucial. But if Russia is not able to impose some kind of a deal quite quickly, which I don't think it's going to be able to, then I think that's when those problems begin to actually become real issues. This is a conversation with Mark Galati, one of the world's most renowned experts on Russia and Russian politics, and an honorary professor at the UCL, senior associate fellow at the Royal United Services Institute, and a director of the Mayak Intelligence. We talked about the attack in Moscow, and whether he thought it could have been a false flag operation, or whether the Russian propaganda will succeed in shifting the blame to Ukraine, and about the broader picture. When might the war in Ukraine end, and how? What will be the impact of of the US elections, whether Russia is weaker than it looks, and much more. Thank you to everyone who supports this podcast on Patreon. And now, enjoy the conversation. Great. So uh, welcome to the podcast. Oh, I'm glad to be back. So l let's talk about the, um, uh, the terror attacks in Moscow first. And um, I'd like to go back to the beginning, um, shortly after it happened, because by now, there is, I think, sort of a consensus, at least in the West, that the attack was carried out by the um, Islamic State. But shortly after uh, the attack happened, there was a lot of theories about the attack potentially could have been a, uh, a Russian false flag, similar to how we see the apartment b bombings in 1989. Um, and I wonder, because I know that in your opinion, you, you know, you also agree that it was orchestrated and carried out by the Islamic State. But I wonder if at any point when you've heard the news of this happening, a, a thought popped into your mind that this could have been something like the 1999 and what convinced you otherwise after that? Yeah, I mean, to be honest... It's always obviously very difficult being absolutely certain when it comes to Russia, because Russia has a tendency to always to turn around and, and bite our assumptions. But look, it, it, fairly, it seemed to me fairly clear that it was unlikely to be a false flag operation from the beginning, for the simple reason that this actually is a problem for Putin, not an opportunity. And the problem is, that, or a, a problem for us, is that Ever since the 1999 apartment bombings, which we don't know about for certain, but I think there is a pretty broad consensus, certainly amongst Western analysts, that in some form or another, it was indeed a, an inside job. Now, there, is, there are various theories as to whether Putin was behind it, it was just simply the cabal of people who were promoting Putin, or if indeed it was another particular faction within the Russian government. But one way or the other, that definitely w w was an inside job. And really from that point, almost whenever anything happens in Russia, someone will, will be claiming false flag. In this particular case, I mean, there was, there was a slight discomfort about sort of jumping down very quickly and saying, no, this does not look like a false flag. But, but nonetheless, you know, I, th I think that all of the various arguments that were presented as to why this clearly must have been an, an inside job tended to fall down. The, the fact that the police took quite a long time to arrive. Well, yes, they did take quite a long time to arrive, but frankly, that is the nature of, well, A, police operations anywhere when there's chaos and confusion and no one's sure quite what's happening, and B, particularly the Russian police, who on the whole do not have a reputation for peerless efficiency. Then the other sort of strange claims about all men in blue jumpers who then are meant to have turned up and in the company of the Spetsnaz who are arresting the, the terrorists, which then turned out not to be true, and all these, these other kind of claims. The trouble is that in the modern information age, an allegation, a claim, a groundless one, can very, very quickly run around the world before anyone actually thinks to check it. The classic example was the, the claim that there were no security guards at the Crocus venue on that day. Well, that absolutely was not true. It seems to be at least one security guard was actually killed. We have other cases of security guards ushering people to safety and that kind of thing. But in some ways, that doesn't matter. Because once someone has said there were no security guards or all of the fire systems have been disabled, then that, that's a good story. And it moves. So sorry, this is a very long winded answer. But I think this is the trouble when it comes down to it. The problem is that one tends to make snap judgments based on 
less the specific facts, because we don't know the specific facts at the time, but more our general kind of sense of how we think Russia works. And in my case, yes, I you know, perhaps naively, perhaps astutely felt that actually Russia is, tends to be much less of a sort of well-ordered theatrical environment than, than the false flag people assume especially when it became clear just how clumsy and uncertain was the initial official response from Putin and his spokespeople. And others, they responded based on their initial assumption that, well, of course, in Russia, in this massive security state, nothing like this could happen without the authorities being behind it. So we, we leap with our prejudices and then backfill with the facts. And I wish it were not the case, but that is unfortunately how human beings operate, especially in these kind of not just information dense, but also rumor dense environments. What did you think about the fact that the Ukrainian military intelligence came out pretty shortly afterwards and said in a quite straightforward way that it was a Russian provocation? I mean, I wish they hadn't done that, to be honest. Um, I think that it would be nice if they had taken the, 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 the high ground, moral high ground. The, the thing is, what we've got to realize is that Russians are finding themselves in not just a, a kinetic, but also an informational struggle with the Ukrainians. And the Ukrainians are often proving to be much, much better at it. Remember, Hur, military intelligence, Ukrainian military intelligence, has also pushed out all kind of other ideas about, for example, Putin's um, alleged illness and his imminent death. Or all kinds of other things. I mean, because that's what they're doing. Their job is to make Russia bleed. And if by putting out a narrative that says, of course, this is a false flag, they can sow further dissent and uncertainty within Russia, then I, I imagine, and obviously I'm just imputing this, I imagine from their point of view, that's, that's a good operation. So, I mean, that's very much the, the terms in which I saw it. I saw it as, frankly, people whose job is to conduct information operations against Russia doing their job. Yeah, I think it's interesting in that way that they act uh, maybe in terms of the information competition, they act more like the Russians rather than like Western intelligence agencies who would more stick to the fact rather than muddy the waters. Well, yes, though, maybe if actually we had Russian missiles and drones slamming into our cities, our rules of engagement would become a teeny little bit more uh, flexible. No, I mean, I think, again, this, this is the difference between having the, the joyous luxury of not actually being in anything other than an economic and political war and actually finding yourself in what is a pretty existential struggle. So, look, it's, it, it's sometimes a little distasteful when the Ukrainians do it because precisely they are meant to be that much better than the Russians. They're, they're meant to be the good guys. But, you know, in time of war, everyone gets, gets down into the mud. And, and in any way, case, whatever one can say about the differences between Ukrainians and Russians, they are both heir to the same kind of tradition of Soviet era political operations. And, you know, actually the similarities are also quite important. Yeah, to be honest, from my side, that wasn't meant as, as criticism of the Ukrainians in any way. No, 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 fair enough. But uh, right now, the, the entire Russian propaganda machine uh, seems to be putting a lot of effort into reframing the attack as basically being carried out or being um, a fault of the Ukra of Ukraine and, you know, its Western sponsors, U UK and the US. And I wonder... Um, given the amount of evidence and also the history of Islamic terror attacks in, in Russia, do you think that this narrative can be successfully sold to the public and sort of molded into the wider Russian propaganda narrative of war against Ukraine? Yeah, I think that it's a pretty clumsy attempt to amalgamate jihadist trigger pullers with Ukrainian backers. And at the moment... And this is inevitably purely sort of anecdotal, but sort of dipping into social media and, and the like, I, I don't get the sense that it's really getting much traction with Russians. I think to a degree, it reflects the fact that obviously Putin is never going to let a crisis pass without blaming it on the usual demons. That is to say, Ukraine, the Americans and, of course, you know, the perfidious Albion, MI6, does seem to be behind everything, I'm sure, if he ever stubs his toe on the stairs, he will somehow find a way of blaming MI6 for that. 
And I, I said, I, I'm not sure if it's really working in specifics, but what we also have to realize about this kind of disinformation campaign is that it can still have a kind of residual effect. You may think, well, what nonsense, the idea that Ukrainians would be hiring Tajik jihadists to carry out a terrorist attack. But on the other hand, it can still just leave you with that sense that somehow the Ukrainians are morally disgraceful individuals. So I think that's really his intent. And I think, therefore, it, 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 it's not likely to sort of to move the needle dramatically. And the interesting thing is that except from some of the more outspoken and toxic commentators in the Russian media, there doesn't seem to be any great we need to be launching reprisals against the Ukrainians now kind of movement or even frankly within those close to the government let alone the, the wider public so you know I, I think i think it has kind of limited value but the point is from putin's point of view i do suspect that he's having to tread a very fine line of course the russians realize that it's islamic state Khorasan that was behind it and we pretty much had indications from that from the sort of the kind of people who tend to be the mouthpieces of the security agencies but on the other hand, he's also worried that if, if he focuses too much on that, then the likelihood is that there will be a, a, a demand and the need for some kind of crackdown on Central Asians. The Russian economy is currently facing a labor crisis between the needs of the war and the needs of the defense industrial complex. And the millions of Central Asian guest workers are absolutely vital to keeping the economy going. And if anything happened to end up driving a certain number of them out and making people think twice about coming to Russia, then actually that would have an impact on the economy and indeed on the, the whole war fighting venture. So I think from, from Putin's point of view, he doesn't want to focus too much on the Islamic and Central Asian issue. And he's trying to find a way in which he can square this rather ugly circle, because let's face it, no one is going to look at these collections of Tajiks and assume that they are naturally partisans of Kiev. I guess another reason why he's pushing the, the Ukraine narrative is that he doesn't want to create the impression that there are now two major threats or that Russia is, has to be waging two separate wars, once against Ukraine and once against um, Islamic terrorism. But the fact is that there is the threat is there. And I imagine that Putin can't really afford another similar attack like this to happen. But at the same time, the, the Russian secret services, I would imagine, are probably already quite busy with with the war in Ukraine and domestic opposition and, you know, spying on the West. And do you think that they will be forced to shift some of their resources from that to now focus once again more on the counterterrorism issue? And how will they deal with this in the practical sense of things? Yeah, I mean, this is interesting because, frankly, Russia has been in a struggle with Islamic State for years. Most of the recent high profile terrorist attacks that are carried out or at least or, or even the plots actually came from Islamic State Khorasan or various kind of people associated with it, rather than, for example, the North Caucasus, which was traditionally where, where the main terrorist threat came from. And in fact, earlier this month, on the 7th of March, we actually had a case of a, an intended armed attack on a synagogue in, I think it was Kaluga region, um, which was foiled by the authorities. So th th there's actually a, a fairly constant stream of attempts, attacks and actual attacks that are carried out. But because they're not massive casualty events and because they're not in Moscow, St. Petersburg, they don't tend to get much coverage. But nonetheless, you know, it is clear that there is this long time struggle because as far as Islamic State Khorasan is concerned, I mean, this is the affiliate that is based in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Central Asia, primarily. Russia, the Russian crusaders are really their, their main immediate threat. The United States is, of course, the great Satan, but it's now it's a long way away. And therefore, Russia is actually where, where they focus many of their targets, because as far as they're concerned, Russia suppresses Islam. It supported uh, the Syrian government, amongst others, against Islamic State. And just generally, you know, it, it is regarded as, as a crusader state. So when we come to this issue about resources and the focusing of resources, the, the Federal Security Service and the other security agencies are very large. And they have people who, whose job is precisely to be looking for terrorism. And I don't get any sense that they have been reallocated. This is not like, say, after 
when suddenly you had a whole bunch of people being taken out of the FBI's organized crime divisions and being hurriedly retrained for the new counterterrorism center. You know, you've actually got structural changes here. You know, people are still doing their job. Trouble is, first of all, dealing with Central Asian terrorism is a real problem. It's not like the North Caucasus, where they have years and years of experience. They have a, you know, a lot of analysts who really know the territory. And they also have networks of informants. Central Asians, it's very hard for them to penetrate. They tend to be a very mobile population coming to Russia for a month, a season, a year, and then heading back and maybe then coming back. They often live in very impoverished conditions, but that tends to mean very close together. So you might have sort of one rundown little apartment where a dozen you know, Tajik or other Central Asian workers are living. Frequently, they all come from the same village or neighborhood or extended family. It's very hard to then place an informant in that environment. So, you know, actually, th they are a pretty hard target from the FSB's point of view. Where I think the issue of um, distraction, shall you say, and diversion of resources comes in is not the kind of the day to day work. It's probably when, you know, a relevant department thinks there is a, you know, what we think of as a plausible threat. We need more resources to deal with this. Or we want the state to do something like, say, well, close down concerts for this month or something like that. That's, I think, when, when the problem comes in. Because absolutely, you're, you're totally right. At the moment, the pressure coming down from the Kremlin is to say that the priorities are Ukrainians and domestic political opposition. And if you have a case that relates to those, you can get extra resources pretty easily. If someone comes along and say, I've got some tajiks I'm a bit worried about. You know, your, your chances of being able to get extra resources allocated to the case are, are pretty minimal. So, yes, it is a factor, but I don't think it's we, we should assume that somehow Moscow had totally forgotten about central elections. It's more a that sometimes terrorist attacks are going to get through regardless, alas. And b that actually dealing with this central Asian problem at the moment is actually a pretty intractable problem for the FSB and co. So do you think that the fact that this attack of this size has happened now is more or less random and it was bound to happen at some point regardless of whether the war is happening or not i think it is i mean as i understand it these things tend to be driven by opportunity it's not like some some central command says we think that it's worth having an attack on a concert in moscow region in may of 2024 it's you happen to have people who reach that pitch of radicalization at which they're willing to carry out an attack from which they may well not get, get to flee. And then you think, well, what's, what assets have we got that we can give them? I mean, Alaska, especially since February 22, the war, guns have become very, very easy to get in Russia as people bring back you know, trophies from the battlefield and sell them on the black market and so forth. But also, you know, what seems to be a suitable target at, at the right time? Because in some ways, you can't keep these people at this pitch. They're, they're not like secret agents, sleeper agents who sort of you, you place and then when you want to activate them, you do. On the whole, there's a psychological moment when they can be unleashed. And if you miss that moment, then you may not get to unleash them later. So I think it does tend to be opportunistic. And they just look for the kind of the, what from their point of view was the biggest target. Maybe it was driven by perhaps they had people within, let's say, the, the cleaning staff who, who could actually scout out the building in advance or, or, or something like that. We, we, we don't yet really know about the preparations. But if you think about it, this is after all, this is a very simple, almost, dare I say it, amateurish attack. You know, four guys with Kalashnikovs just walk into a venue, start shooting it up, set some fires with sort of some gasoline tanks, then jump into a car and, and, and drive off and... I suspect they were heading to Belarus, not Ukraine. Um, you know, there wasn't a case of multiple cars to, to put people off the scent or any sort of subtlety to it. it. It's a proof that, unfortunately, you know, basically, as we saw in Prague quite recently, as we saw earlier in Paris, you know, it doesn't t you know one or a few people with with automatic weapons can do a lot of harm in a crowded location. Another aspect that I thought was really interesting, even though in a slightly or quite a disturbing way, was the treatment of the perpetrators of the attack um, who were arrested uh, afterwards. Or more than that, the, the fact that it was highly publicized by the Russian media and sort of celebrated. Um, and 
both the level of the attention and the level of the brutality to me seems something that I haven't really seen in Russia before or even anywhere else. And I wonder if this was, in your, your view, something that was purely maybe organic and sort of an organic expression of the anger or whether this was a, some kind of a strategy coordinated effort with some kind of a purpose behind it. Yeah, it, it was quite extraordinary. And as you say, deeply disturbing. I mean, look, we've known that the Russian security forces use torture as an instrument when, to be blunt, they want to. But to actually have it not just videoed, but then publicly shown and then discussed improvingly um, on, on, on the national media. I mean, even I think it was in the tabloid Moskovsky Komsomolets, there was a former special forces person speaking approvingly and particularly noting the, the tactic of cutting off a Muslim's ear and sticking it in his mouth. Oh, yes, you know, that's that's a well-known tactic. But it's apparently, he said, particularly useful with Muslims because they believe the line in the Quran that says that sort of Allah will lift people to heaven by their ears. So take off one ear and oh, you might not get to heaven. Um, and again, it, it was presented in, in such matter of fact terms was was indeed very shocking. And I think, I mean, in part, it reflects, in my opinion, a deeply worrying and saddening kind of debasement of Russia of late, really since the start of this war. Um, you know, that the, the we have seen not just kind of the tactics that have been used in the war, but also a lot of the language and sort of the public narrative and, and descriptions as being actually, you know, really speaking to a kind of, I hesitate to use the word gangster approach, but nonetheless, what shall I say, a gangster morality certainly obtains within the Kremlin. But secondly, part of me wondered if, again, this was in some ways an attempt to assuage a public who were going to be denied a nice kind of cathartic end. This is the thing. I mean, had Putin been willing to, to say, yes, this was Islamic State, in theory, they could have identified some Islamic State targets somewhere out in the, in the hills of Afghanistan or whatever and launched some cruise missile attacks and say, we found who was responsible and we have killed them all. There's that moment of saying, there you go. Here you are, people of Russia. A terrible thing has happened, but don't worry. We have demonstrated that, that the motherland can still reach out and uh, punish those responsible to deter anyone else. Given that now the blame has been placed on Ukraine, Britain and America, there's not really much Russia can do or Putin can offer the Russian people. Ironically, this took place at the moment of a particular spasm of cruise missile and drone attacks on Ukrainian civilian targets. which is clearly something that's been planned for quite some time and they've been saving up um, missiles for it and so forth. So it's not like he could then say, we're going to now start launching some strikes against the Ukrainians. You know, there, there isn't really much he can do that is not going to be ultimately self-harming against Ukraine, let alone the United States and Britain. So because Putin's narrative means that he's not going to be able to offer this cathartic end point, in some ways I do wonder if, and maybe this is over-intellectualizing, but nonetheless I do wonder if in some ways a willingness to show at least just what's being done to these four guys is an attempt to satisfy the the anger and the fear that inevitably Russians are feeling right now. I've also heard an interpretation that this could have been done to, as you say, find a target for or find a, a, a way to deliver this satisfaction of retribution, but at the same time avoid people from trying to take it out on Tajiks and uh, Central Asian immigrants, because um, we have seen, um, I think, that there was this uh, emphasis on terrorism, not having a nationality, and, you know, Tajiks are actually not to blame. So it does seem that Kremlin is quite careful with not um, stirring some ethnic uh, unrest within the Russia. Absolutely. Um, and I think in, in the sort of the wider context, again, it's, it's looking for other ways of, of channeling this fear and anger that the Russian people have got. It's the same way as like we now see debate about the reintroduction of the death penalty. Now, look, there's no indication that Putin or the rest of the, of the sort of system is particularly keen on this. If they had wanted, they've had 24 years in which they, they, they could have done this. 
Um, but nonetheless, at the moment, by raising it, again, it, it, it acts as a bit of a kind of a lightning rod that can kind of attract all, all these various angers and such like and give the sense that it will be a deterrent. Of course, it's not a deterrent. But nonetheless, it's, a, it's another way of telling Russians, don't worry, we have it in hand and we're going to do really brutal, ugly things to make sure that something like this doesn't happen again. As I said, it's, it's a fake promise. But nonetheless, at the moment, it's an important one because, look, this has a key, a clear impact on Putin's political authority and legitimacy. Because after all, once upon a time, he had two basic function, you know, roles which legitimized him. One, he was the, the great provider, that he presided over a period in which Russians lived better than they had at any point in their lives before. But he was also the stern defender who would ensure that no one would mess with Russians and, and the motherland. Now, for most Russians, life is not getting better at the moment. They, they don't really have any faith in him as the provider. So he has to double down on his role as the, as, as the defender. And in that context, clearly, he has failed. This attack has happened. So he needs to sort of sh to basically redouble his efforts to show that, in fact, he is responding to it, even though he doesn't really have any answers. I think that sort of leads me to the second topic that I'd like to talk about, and that's to maybe to take a step back a little bit and look at the wider Russian strategic situation and, and Putin's uh, strategic situation. Because in recent months, the way that I read it, uh, I feel that the Kremlin has really been trying to signal how strong the Russian position is that you know they could keep the war going indefinitely if they wanted to that the public is on their side that the economy you know is doing better than ever that the sanctions have failed and i feel like they were quite successful in the west i don't know how about Ru in russia but this narrative seems to have taken quite a hold but i would maybe argue or it could be also argued that the reality is maybe a lot less positive for Russia, and that there's a lot of problems sort of bubbling under the surface from, you know, the war basically burning through half of the Russian sovereign wealth fund from the fact that there is a lack of enthusiasm for the war. Now, maybe you could count in the threat of the Islamic terrorism and quite a lot of other issues. And I wonder if you sort of zoom, zoom out how do you maybe which of the two views would you tend to agree with and how do you view the wider strategic situation that Russia and Putin are in? Well, look, of course, I, I will be sort of deeply cynical and actually agree with both. The thing is often it's a question of why, where you put your focus and particularly in this case, time wise. At present, is Russia in a pretty good position? And the answer is yes, it essentially is. Ukraine, the forces there have still not managed, frankly, to regroup after last year's not particularly successful counteroffensive. At present, the Russians clearly have a massive advantage in terms of artillery and ammunition. I mean, even if one looks at, at the air war, I mean, basically, you know, they're, they're actually managing to step up their bombing of Ukrainian positions along the front line and, and behind it. They are still managing to recruit, not quite in the numbers that they claim, but still, they're basically still able to rely largely on volunteers rather than having to launch another mobilization wave, which may still happen if they decide they need a real surge of, of, of troops. But they can certainly keep up their current stage of operations with, with the people that they can recruit. And absolutely, the West is in disarray. You have America continuing to, to not be able not be of providing the, the aid that's been promised. In Europe, there is actually clear disconnects between the sort of political ambitions of different figures. You know, you have Macron hinting at the presence of ground troops, or the, the ground troops could be deployed in, for combat operations in Ukraine, quickly being slapped down by the Germans and the Brits and the Czechs and the like. You know, in that kind of context, I think we have to recognize that at the moment, the Russians are basically in, in stronger position. And we can expect to have some more bad news from the battlefield. Not catastrophic. I mean, I think that although there is the possibility that the Russians could achieve some kind of breakthrough that then could be exploited, more likely is just a sort of a slow pushing back of the front line. 
and maybe an, uh, an offensive against Kharkiv. That's currently being talked about as the next potential big move. So here and now, absolutely, Russia seems to be in a strong position. Putin's just awarded himself his 87% election victory. Um, the What the Russians are now calling the world majority, you know, global south, is clearly, frankly, not wanting to get involved in this war, which counts as a win for Russia. However, it's a question of when you pull back and think actually about the sort of the longer term thing, because it, it's not like Russia is going to be able to win the war in the next eight months or whatever. Therefore, one has to look at what's going to happen afterwards. By the end of this year, Ukrainians probably would have had a chance to regroup if they managed to finally pass their law on mobilization in particular. It may well be. I mean, I think people I talk to in D.C. think that there will be more aid coming from the United States. Probably not exactly the sort of the package that Biden had originally hoped for, but something. Western attempts to beef up their military production, particularly in terms of ammunition, will have borne fruit, as well as the Czech initiative to buy from outside uh, the, the Europe and, and the Western sort of alliance. And you know, it's likely that the available supply of manpower willing to go and fight in return for the admittedly quite substantial payments being offered will begin to dry up. Russia will have to rely, if he wants to launch offensive operations at least, it will have to launch another mobilization wave, which is very disruptive and, and politically unpopular. And that's when I think a lot of the deep-seated issues begin to become much more sort of visible, especially because, look, at the moment, the, the Russian defense industrial sector is basically working out 24-7, three shifts, full, full sort of wartime level. You can't do that indefinitely before not just workforces, but actually plant begins to run down. Things break. And this is when you'll find that actually a lack of spare parts for the machinery that produces the kit will begin to become an issue. And you can't buy it anymore from the West. Sure, you could retool with Chinese equipment, but that takes time. You actually have to take production lines off use in order to rebuild them. So, I mean, there's, there's, as, as you've indicated, I think there's a lot of challenges that are sort of looming. And at the moment, they're not crucial. But if Russia is not able to impose some kind of a deal quite quickly, which I don't think it's going to be able to, then I think that's when those problems begin to actually become real issues. Let me take a quick break here from the conversation to tell you about my Patreon. I do these interviews in my free time because I enjoy them, but if you want to help me make more of them, consider becoming a supporter. In return, you will be able to ask my future guests your questions, get Patreon-only episodes and bonus content, and watch all the interviews a couple days early and without ads. You can go to patreon.com slash decoding geopolitics or use the link in the description to check it out. But whatever you do, thank you for watching. And now, back to the conversation. I guess... If I was in the shoes of Putin, I would be probably aware of all of this. And my strategy would be to try to get as much successes in this year, because there is the realistic, quite realistic uh, probability or an option that, you know, a year from now, um, the situation on the battlefield would be relatively basically the same, except as you've suggested there might be more and more problems appearing um, on the Russian side, and maybe the, the ratio will start to shift against Russia. So do you think that in Kremlin, they're thinking about, you know, how do we get out of this? How do we um, find a solution to end this in our favor? Or do you think they're just thinking, oh, we can just, you know, go on with this, forever yeah this is the interesting thing i mean first of all it, you raise the question of what putin knows and understands and that is crucial i mean it was interesting that, for example recently there was a piece in bloomberg saying that in fact according to various insiders putin had been present at meetings in which officials had basically ruled out the ukrainian dimension to the terrorist attack and had said it was an islamic state now i found that reassuring because although obviously it's a different matter to actually saying that Putin believes that. 
but at least he's still being exposed to some views that may run counter to his immediate kind of political intentions. So, OK, let's assume that Putin knows what's what. Certainly, if he rang me up for advice, I'd be saying, actually, in many ways, your, your strongest time to be making a deal is when you look to be in the ascendant. Because once the pendulum has begun to swing the other way, actually, not only are you less likely to get a, sort of a good deal, but on the other hand, also, you're you less likely to get a deal at all because the other side thinks time is on its side. However, Putin has not yet, for some strange reason, rung me up for advice. And I think that the, the idea is rather precisely to use this year to try and create the most advantageous position possible. And this is why I think maybe we might see some kind of movement against Kharkiv to actually take you know, a, 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 a major city. On the principle that then when there are some kind of negotiations, which you know, there is the assumption that someday they will have to be some kind of talks. No one quite knows when and how, but someday they will. That in some ways that establishes the baseline. The Russians have a tendency to negotiate very aggressively and very much try to kind of push the baseline as far out in, in, in their favor as possible with the expectation that they will, you know, they will negotiate hard, but they may well have to make concessions. So on that principle, you want to start as far you know, sort of away from, from, from where you are now as possible. So I think that's rather their strategy. I think that the, the, their hope is that actually there's going to be a Donald Trump election and that he will, I mean, I know he's, you know, it's always dangerous to take what Donald Trump says at face value. Um, but nonetheless, I mean, it's clear that he doesn't really want to be continuing to be spending money on the war. And he's claimed that he would be able to end the, end the war in a day and, and, and impose negotiations. Well, I think this is, this is really what the Russians are hoping for, that actually, if there is a Trump election, that a dispirited West will basically lean on the Ukrainians to make some kind of a deal, regardless of the terms almost. And from that point of view, then, the more bargaining chips the Russians have, the better. Now, as I said, there, there, there's, there's a whole load of problems with the assumptions behind that. But that just does seem to be what, what the current strategy is. I think ultimately what Putin wants is to hold on to the territories that he's conquered and some degree of sanctions relief. And from his point of view, the question is, in a way, what does he have to give the Ukrainians, the, sort of the, the remaining rump Ukrainian state in return? Now, I think they're still hoping that they can impose neutrality on Ukraine, so relatively small armed forces, no NATO membership and the like. But, well, I, I don't quite think those are terms that Ukraine is willing to accept, but that's a whole other issue. And anyway, the actual negotiations will depend so much on what's happening, not just on the battlefield, but behind the battlefield at that time. And in case, because I agree that the I imagine that from the Russian perspective, the U.S. elections might represent some sort of a breaking point. But in case Joe Biden wins and remains the president, how would that change the calculus for the Russians? I suppose it, it all depends really on, I mean, anyway, because Biden's the president now. So, in, you know, in, in some ways, do, do, they, do they think that actually a, another Biden presidency is something which is going to see more or less U.S. support for Ukraine? And also what, what happens in, in Europe. I mean, you know, it's worth noting that there are more elections than just the, the American ones sort of coming up. But I think in a way, if, if, if Biden comes, then it, it'll be a question of just seeing, well, what, what, are, what are his policies and, and what are his priorities? And also, what, well, how much trouble is he in? I mean, look, one way or the other, it's almost certain this is going to be a nasty election in America. And frankly, the Russians, I imagine, will do everything they can to make it even nastier. I mean, this is the important, this is the way that Russian hybrid political information operations work. They don't actually, or certainly I think they, they have steered clear now of trying to actually influence the direct outcome. I think they realize that they can't actually do so. Largely when they've done so or tried to do so, if, particularly if we look at uh, earlier German and French elections, it's actually proven counterproductive. Instead, what they do is capitalize on the fact that elections are moments of particular division and dissent within countries. And they try to do everything they can to, to open up the various fault lines within a the system. They have no magic mind control powers. They can't make people 
dissatisfied. What they can do is identify all these dissatisfied constituencies and basically try and make them more dissatisfied, more angry. And, you know, in, in that respect, I imagine that America will give them so, so many opportunities to do that. So it also depends very much on what kind of a country is Biden in charge of if he, if he becomes elected. How much freedom of maneuver does he have? One more question is the last time we spoke, uh, we talked about this um, uh, concern that was, I think we spoke in, in December, and there was this growing concern about a an escalation from the Russian side in some form of a military uh, aggression against NATO. And I think that in in the months since then, this concern didn't go anywhere. And if anything, I would say it probably uh, grew. And I wonder, you were at the time, you were very skeptical, I think, maybe in opposition to how many experts have publicly spoke about this this threat or the level of this threat and i wonder if you if you still hold that view and how do you how do you assess the large number of uh, high ranking politicians and, and military officers who in the recent months have um, spoken about this uh, imminent level of threat against nato from uh, russia militarily Yeah, I still haven't had someone able to explain to me quite how and why this, this would really happen. And I think in part it's because of a lack really of a common understanding of what actually a Russian victory in Ukraine would look like or would mean. A lot of people assume that somehow that means all of Ukraine is under Russian control. Russian tanks are sitting on the Romanian and Polish borders. And also that all the resources of Ukraine, all the people are somehow now available to the Russians. I've, I've heard that being mentioned a lot of late. I think the idea that Ukrainians would be happy and compliant citizens of the Russian Federation under any circumstances is, is pretty untenable. I mean, there's no real sense that Russia, I think, is going to be able to achieve that kind of a breakthrough. But even if it did, I think, frankly, it would be fighting a nationwide guerrilla war rather than actually be able to draw on, on, on Ukrainian resources. I think we, we shouldn't underestimate the Ukrainians' continued willingness to resist, even if their sort of actual forces have been broken down. More broadly, it's about the capacity of force reconstitution, which still, I mean, this is, this is an area which is increasingly taking the role, frankly, of theology. It's about belief as much as anything else. I still find it hard to uh, imagine a situation in which the Russians can, can arm at the rate that is presumed for about five years after the end of war. And I think this is the crucial thing. All of this presupposes that it happens after the war in Ukraine ends, and we still have no idea when that's going to be. And I cannot imagine that it could be earlier than late next year. And that, I think, is... a uh, a relatively early sort of possibility. But okay, let's, so let's say late 2025, the war is over and Russia moves straight into putting the same amount of resources into rearmament. It presumes that precisely that its defense industrial complex is up to that, that the, the inputs, the investment, the workforce, and just simply the, the plant can, can basically keep this tempo up for five years. It presupposes that the Russian economy can manage to keep up this level of spending. Remember, we really, what, about 40% of the federal budget is being spent on defense at the moment. And that is at the expense of health, of education, of infrastructure, of social provision. Again, the, the longer you do that, there is also not just a de degrading effect on the economy as a whole, but also political dissatisfaction presumes that for five years, Russians will also be, continue to, 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 do, to accept this. And again, okay, this is not a democracy. Let's not pretend otherwise. But nonetheless, the Kremlin does have to worry about not pushing Russians beyond their, their, their breaking point. So it presumes that, okay, in 2030, Russia has rearmed. But rearmed to what? The interesting thing is that on the whole, the baseline figure is rearmed to the level of January 2022. Meanwhile, NATO is arming. Now, one could ar argue that maybe it's not arming fast enough or well enough. 
and that 2% is, is, is not enough and maybe it should be 2.5% of GDP or 3% or whatever that they spend. But the interesting thing is, look, if Putin is going to spend five years arming at breakneck pace, that is not something you can do subtly. We will know that that's what he's doing. And so Putin will have re-equipped re to levels of January 2022 in 2030. And meanwhile, NATO will have had the chance to, to, to build itself up to, to this level too. And it's interesting that recently Putin has twice made this point about the fact that Russia would be insane to actually fight with NATO because precisely of the massive disproportion of the NATO economies versus the Russian economy. And again, very, very explicitly actually made that point about the difference in resources. And the final point, as you can tell, I'm, I'm on my soapbox here. And the final point, so even if we assume that, that Putin has managed to rearm and he's in, there and still in power in 2030, at the end, after all, of this current uh, political you know, term as president, he's got his force to, to 2022 levels. Why would he go after NATO? Now, I think it, it, the interesting point is now if, if NATO by that point has collapsed or the United States has basically pulled out or whatever, then to a degree, all bets are off if he's actually talking about individual countries that he can deal with. But assuming that NATO as an alliance is still present, and let's be honest, even if Donald Trump gets elected, he will no longer be president by 2030. There'll be someone else in, in power then. But, you know, at that point, What's in it for Putin? Ultimately, NATO for the moment is not a problem because he actually ha has demonstrated any uh, territorial demands or claims on Finland or Poland or whatever. It's because NATO is supporting Ukraine and stymieing his attempts to, as he sees it, bring a country which ought to be within Russia's sphere of influence back into that um, orbit. So, you know, from his point of view, he wants to disrupt NATO. He wants to deter NATO. That is not the same as saying he wants a full-scale war with NATO. So I said, sorry, I, I have rambled on at great length, but I haven't, I mean, in, in a way, I haven't yet had, for me, a convincing argument as to why all these things, actually, all these stars would align, why Putin would want to do this, except just general terms about saying, oh, well, you know, Putin would never stop. Oh, well, why wouldn't he? He has ambitions. He grabs them. You know, when he went into Georgia in 2008, he carried out the mission he wanted. They could have rolled further on into Tbilisi if they'd wanted to, but they didn't because that wasn't what the mission was. I guess that sort of is linked to, and I would love to hear your opinion, with these historic parallels that we make uh, where we compare, very often we compare Putin with, with Hitler um, or with Stalin. And I wonder if you think that these are accurate in any way or if they're useful to sort of create these these metaphors with the past. And look, I'm a historian by training and I'm never going to say that history is not useful. I think, though, that, again, one has to just treat them with caution. History never repeats itself directly. History provides us with a kind of an, an analytic toolbox, a whole succession of different metaphors which can be useful try and understand how different leaderships work, how systems can work, how, how nations can, can interact with each other. But we have to be very, very clear about the limits of the values of these metaphors, that these are not natural predictions. And this is why I, I find it problematic when there's the whole Putin is the new Hitler, Putin is the new Stalin, I don't know, Putin is the new Nicholas I, you, you, you name it, with whoever you want to slot in. These, these are all, all make sense in some ways. They all have some analytic value, though I think the Hitler one is much more problematic because Hitler clearly was driven by more than just simply sort of nationalism, but by a genuine ideology that, frankly, I don't see with, with Putin. Um, and um, and I, I, I've enjoyed drawing the parallel of Putin with Ivan the Terrible. Um, but nonetheless, again, only insofar as, as it helps illustrate our analysis rather than drive our analysis yeah yeah i i, I hear the the argument that we're reliving the 1930s quite often but compared with that i think we're in much much better situation than we were uh, back then but even then it's i mean if i can just say i mean the interesting thing is often it's a it's a thoroughly misunderstood 1930s i mean for example if one thinks of the criticism of, of the british policy of appeasement 
which is worth a lot of criticism. But one of the things that is often misunderstood is actually the degree to which appeasement was not just simply that, that uh, Chamberlain believed that that nice Mr. Hitler would actually follow through with any agreements. It was an attempt precisely to forestall war, while at that time, Britain was actually arming or rearming faster than Germany was. It was precisely that sense that now is not the time to be directly sort of, you know, at war with Germany. Let's see, A, you know, if we're lucky, we can actually forestall war in, in totally by, by meeting what seemed to be some kind of at least semi-legitimate uh, claims and demands. But if we're unlucky, at least we push back the war long enough for us to have built up our, our military capabilities. There, there is a degree of cynicism that is often understated. So often it's not just, I mean, again, if we're going to do historical parallels, fine, but let they be well-informed historical parallels. I think as someone from former Czechoslovakia, I would probably disagree with the the, 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 the strategy of appeasement being a, a smart choice or a smart strategy. Oh, I'm not saying it's a smart choice. I'm just saying it wasn't as naive a choice as some people are assuming. I think I'd like to use the remaining time that we have to uh, ask questions that I've received from some of the supporters of the podcast on Patreon that are, I think, are quite interesting. And one of them is on what, what we, you've already mentioned, and that's the debate in Europe that was started by Macron um, and his ideas that we might need boots on the ground. And I wonder how do you see those proposals and also the whole Macron arc of, of going from someone who's, you know, a, a, believing to have the Putin's ears to someone who's now positioning himself as the biggest hawk in Europe. Yeah, were I a cynic, I'd assume that just Macron just always likes to be in the spotlight, whatever it takes to do that. And certainly in this case, I mean, Macron's transition from, from one position to the other, you know, is is striking and not necessarily entirely convincing. Let's be clear. I mean, if he absolutely thinks that, that Western combat troops ought to be in Ukraine, there is nothing stopping him sending French troops. He does not need NATO's approval or a vote in the European Council or anything like that. He can just do it. One notices that he is not doing it. I think there is a degree to which... Let's get let, let's get the cynical stuff out of the way before we talk about the genuine stuff. I mean, yes, I think this is Macron chasing headlines. It's also actually Macron looking to outflank his political opposition at home when you have Le Pen very much seem to be sort of rather cozy with the Russians. And he very much wants to put them on, on, on the back foot by, by illustrating the difference between their positions. And there is an element in which he's also looking to basically establish himself once again as the, the kind of leading voice in Europe at a time when the German capacity to do that is, is pretty distinctly limited. So that's the kind of cynical political dimension. And I'd also add that I think his notion about the importance of strategic ambiguity is, I think, deeply flawed. Strategic ambiguity, this idea that we keep the Russians guessing about quite what we're going to do, that works if you think that the Russians regard you as being really strong and formidable and willing to take risks and losses. We've seen already, though, the degree to which it fails. Strategic ambiguity was in play in the lead up to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. When there were all kind of warnings to Putin, don't invade, bad things will happen. But we never specified, and this is primarily the Americans, to be honest, quite what those bad things would be. And therefore, the Russians thought, look, we've heard all this before. We've seen this with Georgia, we've seen this with Crimea, we've seen this with the Donbass, we've seen this with MH17. Yeah, you'll, you'll sanction a few individuals and, and this, that and the other, but basically there's not much. I think a lot more effective would have been a strategic lack of ambiguity. If we had actually said, behind closed doors, rather than making it in some kind of macho contest, look, if you do what we think you're about to do, this is the minimum of the various measures we're going to take, and there will probably be more. And we will do everything we can to smash your economy. We will be arming Ukraine, whatever. Maybe that actually would have been rather more effective. So, and I, so I think we, we really need to appreciate the strategic ambiguity has not served us well. However, I think you know, what, what is important about Macron's intervention is, I mean, first of all, it, it has put more pressure on the Germans, who, although interestingly, they, they provide a hell of a lot of money for Ukraine. 
you know, we have we have to recognise the the degree to which actually much more than the French. I mean, the French talk a lot, but actually, in terms of the actual proportions of aid, they're not doing that well. Frankly, the Italians provide more. Um, but also, I think from from the point of view of of the ground troops issue, it has focused discussion quite usefully on what happens in the nightmare scenarios. What happens if, for example, the Ukrainian lines do break? or the Russians have a major breakthrough. And it looks as if they are threatening Odessa or Kharkiv uh, or indeed Kyiv. You know, are we willing to just sit back? And although I really don't want to see NATO ground troops deployed, because I think that does bring us into a full shooting war. Nonetheless, I think it's really important to have the discussions now, rather than as usually happens, when the crisis you know, explodes. And then we suddenly think, you know what we should have done? We should have done that. But the point is, by that point, it, it's too late. So I think he's 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 focusing the debate usefully. But I think he's doing so, frankly, for his own reasons. I, I agree with the cynical view completely. Another question is on sort of what we were talking about and that the fact that, that these might be the, the U.S. elections um, this year might be very messy. And the last ones were already pretty messy. And do you think there is a chance that if there is some post-election chaos, for example, a little like we've seen last time, but maybe on even a greater scale, do you think that Putin could take that as, a, as an opportune moment to stir some, some unrest or push some buttons towards uh, NATO? No, the Russians are going to take any opportunities that we give them. That is the basic thing. I mean, we define the Russians' information battlefield by our own failures, by whether it's the hypocrisies and corruptions of our politicians, our failure to integrate certain communities, or our yeah, sort of generally messy politics. This gives the Russians opportunities. Absolutely. If there's any, any point of, of, of vulnerability that, for example, allows them to try and undermine NATO, or reduce the value of, say, the United States as a, as a NATO member, then, of course, then they are going to take it. How successful they're going to be? Look, NATO, whatever else one may say, NATO has actually been a extraordinary engine of deterrence and, as a result, peace within its membership. I mean, yes, it didn't stop the Ukraine war, but that's not its job. Ultimately, its job is to protect its membership. It is, in that respect, a club. And when it comes down to it, whatever the dissent, the thought of any country willingly leaving it or in any way kind of stepping back from, from membership, I, th I think is, is very questionable. Now, there's always this issue of, well, you know, would actually members rally around if need be? The, the usual way it's framed is would Spain fight for Estonia? I mean, I think, A, the answer is almost certainly yes, actually, if push came to shove. But more to the point, why this really matters is because a lot of it is about Russian perception. If you think that NATO will not actually enforce its Article 5 guarantees, and actually, yes, that NATO would not fight for Estonia, then Estonia becomes vulnerable. The point is, we have to realize the way that Putin mirror images. He sees NATO not as a coalition of countries willingly come together coming together for mutual support but essentially as america's warsaw pact and therefore i think his view is frankly that spain for example in that example would not have a choice as to whether it fights for estonia so yes the russians will do what they can to spread dissent and essentially to paralyze that is their goal on nato as on almost any other issue but it's only up to us if we actually give them the opportunities to really push hard on that particular issue I think it's always um, quite reassuring to hear your views that are quite a little, a lot more opt optimistic than uh, w what you often hear. Um, but the very last question that I have is a bit maybe less geopolitics focused and more on um, sort of a human level. And that's uh, how do you feel about the long term prospects for um, Russian-Ukrainian reconciliation on a human level. I, I think we're not talking about, you know, next couple of years, but sort of a more long-term, long-term period. And do you think that they will ever, and I think most, obviously most of the Ukrainians, they will ever 
be able to forgive given everything all the you know various war crimes and everything that has ha has happened and that we have documented over the course of the war oh yeah that's a really interesting and good question and actually on this one it's hard to be particularly optimistic i think particularly look i can't see this war ending in russia for want of a better word capitulating on accepting that this was an entirely unprovoked, aggressive, imperialistic operation, on, you know, it won't hand over per those who are accused of responsibility in war crimes for tribunals in The Hague. It may grudgingly find itself paying some level of reparations, but precisely, I think it'll be grudgingly, rather than accepting its responsibility, it will just simply be, well, this is the price that we have to pay to get certain sanctions lifted or the like. So, you know, that does not provide for me the basis of any kind of reconciliation. We may well see entirely pragmatic relationships being reforged more quickly than, than otherwise, just simply because there is, you know, there's all sorts of scope still for trade um, and indeed for, for gangster collaboration. But that's a whole other issue. But I don't think that so long as Russia does not, Russia as a state, as well as Russia as a society, does not think that it did wrong and is willing to say so and accept it, which, again, which doesn't necessarily mean something like denazification in, in, in Germany, West Germany, um, but nonetheless, something rather more kind of uh, generous of spirit, then I don't see it can happen, which means that really we're talking at best for a post-Putin Russia. It depends. Is the next leader going to be able to turn around and say that that was a terrible war? It was obviously you, you blame it all on Putin and his immediate circle and so forth. But are, are you know is 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 a you know, next leader willing and able to say it was wrong? Willing and able to say to the Russian people who have lost so many lives after all of you know husbands and brothers and sons. Yeah, sorry about that. They died for no good whatsoever. I think that's going to be too too soon. So we're actually then thinking, well, maybe it's going to be Putin leader plus two. Perhaps by that point, you know, things will have moved along enough. Because as we saw with, for example, the response to the Soviet war in Afghanistan, I mean, on, the, on, a, on a political level, Gorbachev was able to say, it was not my war, it was Brezhnev's war and those cronies, I was not involved in the discussions. And he, indeed, he wasn't that actually sent, sent the, the troops in. So he can negotiate a peace and so forth. But, uh, I mean, I know this because I, I did my doctorate on the impact of the Soviet war in Afghanistan on the system. Um, you know, it was clear that to a lot of people, it was really quite um, shocking and alienating to be told precisely that all of these, these casualties, and frankly, remember, we're only talking 15,000 Soviet dead. So in other words, you know, a, an order of magnitude fewer than have already fallen in Ukraine. But still, to be told that their their deaths were, were for, for no good no good reason is a very difficult thing to sort of stomach. So, you know, I, I think that Russia, I'm hoping that an eventual defeat in Ukraine for Russia can be its Suez Canal crisis or its Algerian war moment, where uh, an imperial country is forced to come to terms, both with the fact of that it's no longer a great power, but also of the degree to which actually, you know, it, it has been an imperial country and needs to sort of move on from that. But that takes generations. So, yes, someday maybe it'll happen, but I suspect we're talking two generations away when memories and experiences of the war have moved from reality into history.